The part-time employees are 12,150. That also happens to be 12,000 or 18.5%. So the part-timers is not a hotel industry specific number. It's not a number because we happen to run lean operations. If we did, those hotels would be half empty with employees. Do you know that our service level, our employee to room ratio here on Guam is two rooms to one employee? We compete in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is six employees to one room. That's the type of thing that we're up against when we compete in this destination, our tourist destination within Southeast Asia. That is what we're up against for the service levels. And yes, we should pay people and make sure we have more employees. But the more we deal with stuff like this, it's gonna make it harder for us to staff and to schedule, to have a lot of full-time staff on this. So with the market at 18.5%, coincidentally, the hotels also have 18.5% for part-time employees. It's actually not coincidental because the hotels are part of the private sector and private sector really bends to the market's demands. That is just the way it works. That is the economies of scale that we deal with on a daily basis. Bill 359-33 states that the tourism industry's uninsured, and this is a direct quote, uninsured employee pool poses a significant risk and presents a danger to the healthcare system. That is a really big assumption, and I think it's inflammatory, but it's not a huge risk that our employees are exposing to our tourism or our community uh, populations. The bigger risk is that the private sector cannot afford costs like this because what we'll have is our additional costs and that'll further limit hiring and reduce part-time employment and casual employment. Of all the numbers that you quoted earlier, yes, everything is up. Costs are up, room rates are up, hotel occupancy tax are up, GRTs are up, but so are operations. The only thing that down is down is fuel, but that's temporary. We've had, we've seen the rise of fuel here at the legislature whenever we've had those hearings or at the PUC. We cannot only, we cannot attribute all of the uh, savings, cost savings to just fuel. There are other things. Water today at GWA, Water actually costs more at the hotel than power sometimes, depending on your operations. And there are other things that go into the expenses, especially the labor costs. So the one thing that did go down in your numbers that you said, everything did go up. The one thing that went down was employment hours went from 39 hours to 36 hours. There was a right sizing of operations and reduction in forces and reduction in staff overall. And there were more employees that went from full-time to part-time over the years, whether it's the recession or even the dollar minimum wage increase. That is what happens when you deal in a service industry. We will reduce staffing and limit hours. Um, and, and the opposite, if you require all, what do you think is gonna happen if you require all part-time and casual employees to have insurance? It's gonna cost more to have the insurance than it would, than they would even make in their paychecks. So they're gonna require more full-time staff to take on additional duties or just move everybody to full-time staff and just really run a lean operations. You're gonna see that really be removed. And then the also the other thing that I, I really uh, thought was kind of inflammatory was the, and I, I really want to make this clear, the employees do not pose a risk to the healthcare system or to the population, the tourism or the local community population. We cannot make statements like that because the tourism industry is very well regulated for, and as well as the service industry or any other private sector that comes in contact with the community. We are so regulated and we have even more regulations the last three years from public health with health certificates with OSHA and bloodborne pathogen and all these other things. We have now the responsible alcohol server, um, you know, sanitary permit. There's so many things in place to protect the community. We cannot just outwardly say that we are posing a risk if we do not have an, if we have an uninsured population. We don't even have the data to support if they are the uninsured population. 
Um, so I just need to make sure that we all understand that our employees, in order for them to be gainfully employed and working in the service industry, they have to have all of the proper certifications and certificates and, and the licenses to operate and work in that industry. So as the largest employer on Guam, next to the government of Guam, yes, we are constantly barraged with new legislation and regulations. Our employers are dealing with all kinds of new requirements, like I said, with Public Health, Guam EPA, Guam Fire Department even, Department of Revenue and Taxation, ABC Compliance Branch. But upcoming, we have the changes to the Fair Labor Standards Act, federal white collar exemption rule, and local changes to the Guam Family Medical Leave Act. These are all things coming up, not to count any new things that might be addressed. To require this is really wrong, and to take this out to a referendum for vote is really wrong. We need to go back to the intent of this bill, which, is the prob which really is back to the problems at GMH. The opportunities are there, though, to work with agencies like Guam Department of Labor to address the issues of the part-time and the casual employees, those who are uninsured because they are gainfully employed or maybe unemployed or displaced workers. Um, or maybe they've been incarcerated and then can't get employed and we need to get them a job. That's all of that, that responsibility is Dr. Sam Abini and her entire agency. We need to work together with that agency to find programs where we can take the unemployed and the dislocated workers. GHRA has been a sponsor, an employer sponsor of apprenticeship and also a trainer for a lot of those programs for dislocated workers. We can work together to provide that necessary training, but the one thing that I've asked Senator Nicholas to look into together with Sam Abini is possibly subsidize or incentivize employer groups to take more people away from casual and part-time into a labor pool. So, th and I've talked to actually a uh, vice speaker about this, is let's get them trained with the proper skills so that they can become full-time. There are programs under the uh, Workforce Investment Act to pay, to help subsidize businesses so that they can get the training, but also pay for their wages and benefits for up to two years so they can become full-time employees. There are programs that exist in place. We're just not coordinating them. So let's work on that. I'm committed to working on that. You guys be committed to working at GMH. I'm committed to getting more people working and full-time employment but it has to come through other programs where these employers aren't constantly attacked, but also are incentivized and subsidized to help place them into the position and get them skilled so that they can qualify and be eligible to get full-time employment and get a better wage. They also can wear, increase their work hours through on-the-job training and Private sector, there are a lot of private sector partners who are in the jobs to career or passport to career office. And there's a lot of ways to improve that unemployment rate. And they all relate to the uninsured market. Yes, you're correct. But it is not the responsibility of the hotels to solve all those problems. Although it's true GVB continues to report record-breaking arrivals, trust me, I deal with this every day. I don't think that they really share the true story all the time. Honestly, they report record arrivals, yes. They, record, they report hotel occupancy taxes up and GRT is up. But I can tell you the fact remains that the industry has been struggling. Although we're at peak season now, the projections for other months aren't as pretty. We are challenged because we have peak seasons and we have non-peak seasons. We are not having the glory days like everybody wants to say, the numbers that you see are actually more from low cost carriers than the other destinations where we used to all get higher paying customers. The truth is arrivals from Japan are down. There are variances between consumers in total spending and there are increasing competitions, like I said, from Southeast Asia where our counterparts have lower cost of labor, some of them better goods and services, and they're just as close. We are obviously working together with GVB as tourism industry stakeholders to help diversify this market. And I think that GVB has done a great job with that together with our hotels and airlines who promote Guam. It's been great 
that we've been able to diversify it because they anticipated Japan going down. So this is really good that we are working together for that, but it doesn't mean everybody's making more money. Costs have been rising and businesses have been adjusting to the rising cost of doing business on Guam. Guam is getting more expensive as a destination also, and businesses will continue to transfer the cost borne onto the consumer as long as prices continue to increase and we will right size operations and adjust productivity. We will find efficiencies that ultimately does affect the consumer and the service levels that you find on Guam. Each time you tax private sector, directly or indirectly, businesses will increase their cost of doing business and right size operations. Today, GHRA strongly seeks your support from all of our elected officials to oppose Bill 359-33. The tourism industry and the employers, especially the hoteliers represented here today, pay their fair share in taxes and fees. It is the government's responsibility to manage the government fees and services and operations without further taxation. The legislature of Guam should be creating laws to help grow our econ economy and not suppress or inhibit our growth by increasing our, the cost of doing business. We strongly appreciate your opposition to this and we appreciate your continued leadership and we look forward to working together with you, especially in this term and your next term, to find solutions to our very big problems here on Guam. So thank you, Sutu Ismasi and Marang Salamapo. Okay, uh, I'll ask uh, the sponsor of the bill to lead off with the questions and then I'll invite other senators. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, um, thank you, Mary, for your testimony. I might have missed it and all that, but um, so how many of your employees have health insurance of the 6,270? 81% are full-time employees. Not my, that's not my question. How, right. many, how, many of the, how many of your employees it's have health insurance? Out of 81%, it, it, it's, it ranges between 75 to 90%. Okay, so if you have all that data, you must know how many of your employees have health insurance. Right. So, so if you take them? the average of 85% out of that, that's who has insurance. Do you have a, a hard number on how many of your employees have health insurance? I guess I would like to answer that question, but at the same time, it has nothing to do with the issue that's at That's actually hand. the underlying point of the whole issue. No, because there are reasons why people don't elect insurance at an employer group. It doesn't mean they're uninsured. <coughs> I'm sure there's re reasons. I'm, it's just a very simple question. How many of your employees have health insurance? I have that data, but again, it has, I, I don't think that it's going to be a solid answer because they may have coverage elsewhere. So I don't want to say who has coverage and who doesn't because they may have coverage elsewhere. So it's not a true statement to say they don't have insurance. It's, that's, that's possible, but I just like a, an idea of how many of your employees have health insurance? So to answer that, I don't have that answer. I don't have that answer because it's not comprehensive. I don't have everybody, I don't have the answer of who else has insurance um, through their spouse. I'm so not I asking, can't completely answer that. I'm not asking for that. you to extrapolate that. I'm just asking of all of your employees, 6,270 of them, how many on your books have health insurance? Sorry, I only brought the aggregate data with me, the percentage. Well, um, you know, I, I asked you for that last night, and I thought that you'd be also bringing that this, uh, this evening. <coughs> but that's really the crux of the question. You know, um, there may be variables as to why some have insurance coverage and some don't. But, uh, you know, here we have a very unique case where we have an opportunity in an industry that's generating hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue, 28 businesses generating hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue, employing 6,270 people as of 2015. An opportunity for us to very, um, in a very targeted fashion, ensure that that population has access to health insurance. Um, how many of that population needs health insurance? We're not getting a solid number uh, from you tonight. But, uh, you know, I would reckon that if we have such a large uninsured population, surely our largest employer has a, a role to play and how many uh, of our people do not have health insurance? Well, I already said the majority of the employees have health insurance, 
81% are full-time. Of that, 75 to 90% have insurance. So majority of them actually have insurance coverage. The remaining is unsure whether or not they have insurance coverage with their spouses and with, or through with other all options. Of that, all, the, all that data, I, you, you cannot give me a hard number but what of does exactly it matter? how many have health because insurance. Because they're not responsible for the for the outstanding receivables at GMH. That's my point. The, the, the whole point of the legislation is to ensure that our um, largest employer that's generating hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue is uh, not creating an insurance or a healthcare liability uh, as a result of not having enough insured uh, employees. So the number of employees that have insurance is critical. And uh, you know, there's, there's different ways to present the data um, you can say 80% are eligible, 75 to 90% um, are taking advantage of it. <coughs> but really, there's just a, there's a hard number, how many have it and how many don't. So I would ask the reverse to you. We actually provide insurance. How many employers don't have insurance? That's the larger number you need to consider. How many people are unemployed and uninsured? Our un unemployed rate is 6.9%. That's a much larger number than what we're talking about. So I think that you're, very, you're being too uh, you know, tunnel vision with this in trying to target one industry when you really should be looking at a larger population. I, I disagree, and the reason why is because you know, with this particular industry, if the costs go up, <laughs> and by the way, they have been going up, even your average room rate was $111 in 2010, it's $159 in 2015, but as those costs go up, they don't um, necessarily translate into higher cost of living expenses for the people of Guam. Uh, a higher room rate doesn't translate into more expensive diapers. But when we talk about raising GRTs in order to make up for the health care shortfalls in our community, that does impact the, the people of Guam. And so for us to be specifically targeting this industry allows us to target 28 businesses. 6,270 employees in a manner that is not going to directly impact the cost of living of the people of Guam. So it's, uh, it's, very, it's very surgical, actually. And that's why the numbers are so important. The uh, numbers of how many of the employees actually have health insurance is a very critical number. <coughs> Another critical number for us to talk about is the, um, the, the wages of this uh, employee base. Because if 80% of them are full-time, that means 80% of 6,270 are making an average hourly wage of $9.35. And uh, that's high enough to price them out of public assistance and Medicaid, but it's not high enough to be able to afford your own medical bills. But how do you know that when you haven't even looked at where the problems lie and wh what these people Because have? to qualify for Medicaid, you have to be below the poverty level of income. And, and have so you looked at that and have you attributed that to the $9.35 and 35 cents comes out to over $18,000 in annual income per employee. But you don't know if it's and related so to hotels. No, $9.35 is the hour, average hourly employee rate in the hotels. But some of them have multiple so jobs. At that, at that <coughs> that's right. And so they're, they're further pricing themselves out of, the, um, out of public assistance. So they fall into that gap between making too much to qualify for Medicaid, but without the hard numbers, also not having the health insurance coverage of the employer. And that puts them into that very unique category of self-pay patients, otherwise known as the uninsured. You don't know that. <coughs> I just explained it to you. No, but you don't know that for sure. I could, I could re-explain it to you if you didn't, if you didn't no, quite catch No, you the, don't know if those individuals are actually uninsured and responsible for those you're bills. You're not telling me how many employees are insured or not. At least I have numbers of who is insured. You don't even know who they are. You how don't many, even know who's... How many are insured? I think you're, you're getting away again from the point that you need to work with GMH if you're really wanting to identify the problems of who makes up the... One, number one, the uninsured market, and number two, the outstanding receivables. Because the AR, the receivables, if you look up the makeup of the receivable, receivables, it's not just the uninsured market. It's also the insured population who can't pay their bills. It's also um, government programs that can't pay back GMH, which is the government of Guam, by the way. That's the bigger problem, and you're really avoiding that by only attacking us. And it's really uh, unfortunate because the tourism industry and the hotels specifically, they do a lot for Guam. G makes up Guam's 60% of the gross domestic product. I say we do more than anybody else 
to help provide fees to the government and taxes, not just taxes of revenue, GRT, hotel occupancy tax, also uh, in income tax, all of those things are things that the government of Guam should be using to help manage the budget and to pay those programs. So we already give you the money, in a sense, plus more to do your jobs. So it's not really our job again to offer more than we already have, especially in a market that's not regulated. You are targeting an industry unnecessarily, and you're trying to do something that's not even mandated across the board. That's really not fair. We actually have mandates for specific industries all over the island. You know,